spatial information lab for Columbia University and teaches things as an architect. Um, and Bradley is a partner at Kitchen Studios and has done extensive work on remote sensing. And together, we're going to um, kick us into a conversation on the nature of remote sensing, its use between politics, architecture, and urbanism tonight. And Bradley's going to start by discussing some of the case studies from um, the Forensic Architecture Project that he's worked on. Um, and Mara will be a responder, but after that, I want to open the floor and invite all of you to join us in that conversation. So without further ado. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Um, I think what I'm gonna do tonight is show two, maybe three case studies, um, projects that we've been working on as part of the Forensic Architecture Project. Uh, and just by way of introduction, the Forensic Architecture Project is a, is a project that's sort of broadly speaking looking at visualization and sort of spatial analysis uh, as it might be applied to human rights and international law. And it's a project that's um, based in London. Uh, we're working with a team out of Goldsmiths College. Uh, A.L. Weissman is the principal investigator. And there's a whole kind of constellation of artists, uh, architects, filmmakers, artists, who are working together um, on very sort of project-driven case studies. And usually, each case study is a, is a sort of constellation of uh, the artist, designer, a human rights organization, and a legal counsel. And we're, our role is basically to help them visualize, uh, analyze, and, and sort of present either in advocacy contexts or in legal contexts reports that they would otherwise already be making. But if they were making them themselves, usually they're just textual. Perhaps there's photographs and maps, but we're sort of proposing to see if we can take it a bit farther um, and do reports with more efficacy uh, when possible. Um, so the first project is, is one uh, we worked on with Charles Heller and Lorenzo Pisani, who are PhD students at Goldsmiths. And it, it's a case um, that occurred in, in March and early April of 2011 during the conflict in Libya. And um, migration from North Africa to Southern Europe is nothing new, of course. Um, but during this period of time, during NATO operations, there was a, a very sort of, there was a surge in migrations. And there was a, these migrations were happening under duress. There were usually uh, um, sub-Saharan Africans who were traveling on really overcrowded vessels um, and, and traveling to, a, three or four places, but from Libya, the, the, the route from Tripoli to Lampedusa was kind of like most heavily traveled route. Um, and these are just some photos of, you can see, uh, you know, the, the military assets in the background and sometimes uh, these smaller boats which are used to sort of interdict uh, uh, the migrants' ships. And the standard sort of protocol during NATO operations was that um, they were there to, to sort of conduct an embargo arms embargo. So they're, they're NATO's role, NATO saw their role as uh, preventing uh, arms coming in and out of Libya. They were not there to save people making the journey from Libya to, to southern Italy. So basically what frequently happened is they would, they, would, they would see these ships, they sometimes would board them, they would determine whether everyone was um, healthy or safe or needed assistance, and if people were not um, in very bad shape, they would just leave the boat to go on its way. Um, what's particularly sort of relevant in this case uh, and at this moment is that it's probably the most highly surveilled area of water in the world between March and April 2011. And you can see all of the sort of military assets that were, that were there just simply to, to sort of monitor these waters, right? And so um, the question in the case that we were uh, asked to look at was a boat that left um, Tripoli on, on March 27th, got about halfway to Lampedusa with 72 people aboard, um, and then ran out of gas and drifted for two weeks. And uh, when it eventually landed back south of Tripoli, there were 11 people alive, and then shortly after, uh, two died, and so there were only nine survivors of the original 72. And the question that we were sort of asked to, to help address was how is it possible that this boat drifted for two weeks uh, without being assisted in waters that were so highly surveilled. Um, this is just a snapshot. I'll just show a quick, I don't know if the audio, yeah, the audio is on, I'll show a quick clip 
that's really NATO's, NATO speaking its own words about their, their operations there. crew are departing from a NATO facility in the port of Augusta in southern Sicily. After stocking up with supplies and refueling, the Canadian frigate HMCS Charlottetown is heading for the waters off the coast of Libya. Its task is to rejoin the NATO operation Unified Protector, aimed at protecting the civilian population of Libya under UN Resolution 1973. The ship's role in this operation is to help enforce the arms embargo against Libya. What we're trying to do is stop the influx of arms, military equipment, and possibly mercenaries into that country so that we can stop um, threats or actually action against uh, civilians and uh, civilian populations. Canada is just one of a growing number of nations contributing to this operation, which began on the 23rd of March. The area of operation is the central Mediterranean, one of the most congested waterways in Europe. Enforcing an arms embargo here requires lots of cooperation and coordination by all the NATO partners involved. What we do is we link all our uh, radar images together, all the ships, and then from that what we're doing is creating sort of a map of all the contacts in the area. We're also working with uh, aircraft as well that are tracking uh, vessels, and from that we have a full picture of all the vessels in the area. Based on this information and other intelligence sources, the commander decides which vessels to board and inspect. I have a boarding team uh, on board, uh, 20 highly trained uh, professional uh, people that I can send over and they can take it, take a look at the papers of the vessel, find out where it's been, um, verify where it's going and can go in and inspect the cargo to make sure it's in compliance with the UN security resolutions. So, this was a kind of interesting moment where NATO was sort of, NATO's PR apparatus was touting sort of the interoperability of platforms between the different assets and also the kind of complete control over this area. Um, so this video that you just saw was actually re released during the campaign as a kind of part of their public relations uh, strategy. Um, this is a photograph of the vessel that, it, that originally had 72 people on it. Um, that only made it halfway to Lampedusa. This photograph was taken by a French aircraft that spotted it um, on the first day of its journey. You can see it's full um, of people. And uh, this photograph actually only emerged about halfway through our investigation um, for the first half of the work we were doing. We didn't, we didn't have this image. But you can see it's a, this is a boat. It's like a Zodiac craft. It's made for 25 people carrying 72. Um, this is a, I won't show the video here, but this is an interview conducted by um, our collaborators, uh, Lorenzo Pisani and Charles Heller of one of the survivors, um, Daniel Hale. Um, and they cover a lot of different territory in the interview, uh, but basically what we're trying to do is, is reconstruct as accurately as we can and to the best of Daniel's recollection, the kind of sequence of events and also specifically what ships and helicopters they came into contact with. The, the survivors all recount coming into contact with two helicopters, or hel coming into contact with helicopters twice, it might have been the same helicopter, it might have been two different helicopters, and coming into contact with one large military vessel. Um, and as you can imagine, after two weeks on the open ocean, um, the testimonies don't always converge with the different survivors, but they do converge very clearly in certain places. And I'm just showing this sort of provide you with an indication of the type of information that we're using, sort of, I would call this kind of testimony-based qualitative information, and then also combining it with um, geospatial information. So this is a, this is a hydrolint alert, um, which provides GPS coordinates of the boat at a known moment in time when the, um, when they called a, a, an air train priest in Rome on the way to Lampedusa as a distress call. And the Italian the air train priest then called the Italian Coast Guard to say there was a vessel in distress, who then got the um, GPS coordinates from their, their satellite phone records, and then sent the uh, position out to NATO command as well as um, Maltese Coast Guard. Um, so those are the sort of two types of information we're dealing with, generally speaking. Um, and this is the kind of first 
attempt at a reconstruction of the sequence of events. Um, and ultimately the question is, it's really, a, it's a very specific law that is driving this. It's a, it's a Uniqlo's law that, that states very simply that you have to help the vessel in distress if you come into contact with one, with one in the open ocean, regardless of who you are, certainly if you're NATO. Um, and we're do, this work is being done, I should also say, for a human rights organization called Mi Kyo Hope, who are filing a case um, against uh, France and Spain separately. I'll, we can get into that later. Um, in any event, the whole point is to construct, reconstruct their trajectory, where they were, and maybe where they were when they came into contact with the other, other boats, other people along their journey. Um, so what we have is the, the point of departure, A, is where the French uh, plane spotted them, and the, the, their coordinates were um, provided by the uh, French military. B is the first position that was provided by um, the Italian Coast Guard, which was the GPS coordinate given by the satellite phone. C is a, a second satellite phone call that was placed. Um, in between B and C, they were, they were visited by a, a helicopter, which sort of came over and then left. Um, shortly after C, the C phone call was made, a helicopter came back, it dropped biscuits and water, and then left again. At this point, this is about um, less than a full day into the journey, everybody's still alive and more or less healthy. Um, and so it, it likely fell into the kind of protocol where NATO would just take a look, make sure it wasn't a, um, people weren't, uh, in need of a, sort of immediate assistance and then, and then left, which is not atypical for their operations at that time. And then between C and D basically is, a, is basically testimony, you know, different survivors saying how long they continued to drive the boat before it ran out of gas. So the white line is with a motor and then they get here and there's some, there's some uncertainty about um, where exactly they stopped. Um, and then the dashed line is, is where they drifted and I'll get to that in a moment. You can see also the, the maritime embargo, sort of where that falls. The dashed lines are search and rescue zones. So this, you know, this is very frequently these these vessels are making this trip, and the Maltese, the Maltese and Italians don't even agree over where their search and rescue zones stop and end. So um, this is the the type of vessel which was important because ultimately we ended up working with an oceanographer. Uh, named Richard Lineburner, who works at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, who, who basically does drift models. So he'll do things like if a plane crashes in the open ocean, like the Air France flight in Brazil, his, he was tasked with um, creating a drift model of the wreckage to try and find survivors. Um, and he can do that based on knowing something about uh, the, the vessel, as well as um, subsurface currents and wind information. The better the data, obviously, the more accurate his model. Um, but this, is, these were, this was information he needed about the boat. Uh, this is uh, some of the information about the currents. Um, and on the right is uh, the model that he came up with, basically, which, I'm sorry, uh, shows the trajectory of the boat over that 11-day um, period uh, as it drifts and then gets back to uh, Zlitan, which is south of Tripoli. And you can see there's a, there's, I think there's six, six uh, kilometers on either side, which kind of decreases to zero as you get to, to the known position of the vessel. Um, and this is just a map, and uh, Richard's model is able to basically tell you, uh, again, with some degree of error, at what point the boat was where on that trajectory. Um, so you can say on what, on what day, yeah, and even, even more granular than that. That's simulated. Okay. So everything from yeah. everything from from point of drift to ending point, those are the only new, only two known points to start. Um, this is a, another version of the same drawing, just telling the amount of space traveled. Interestingly, in this area, you know, when the winds die down, the currents aren't as strong. You just travel less distance. So there's about three days spent in this little area here, and it happens to also be the point at which they they recount coming into contact with a military, a, a NATO vessel. Um, so the question ultimately was, okay, we've, we've got an idea about where they drifted. Um, how can we potentially say something about who or what they may have 
come into contact with uh, over that trajectory. And so we looked at uh, you know, various options. We looked at optical satellite imagery and um, qu you know, quickly realized that coverage of the, over the open ocean is uh, slim to none. And the chance of even if, even if you did get some coverage, the chance of it being available for the days in question uh, even less so. Um, and at the resolution, we needed even less so. So that kind of quickly was ruled out. But we sort of, just in sort of doing, doing um, research onto other remote sensing options, came, stumbled across uh, SAR data, which is synthetic aperture radar. It's, it's also satellite based. Um, and partially because it's frequently used to sort of as a border control for Southern Europe, the orbits and the frequency of the satellites over the Mediterranean provide a ton of coverage. So basically, what it, what it will do is give you a, a radar return uh, of a, you know, a metal vessel in the open ocean. If it's a plastic boat or if it's rubber, it's, it's not a, it won't give you a return. But any metal vessel over a certain size, depending on the resolution of the, of the sensor, will show up as a radar return, basically. And so what this is here is just uh, two tiles which happen to coincide with the period that they were drifting. And so this is, what a, this is what SAR data looks like. You can translate it into you know, imagery, but it is, um, it's just basically the intensity of return. And the intensity of the return can tell you um, what the resolution we had, something about the size of the vessel, um, and, and also potentially how certain we are that that estimation of size is accurate. And so at this point, you know, we thought this would be a good, an interesting option to pursue in terms of talking about what shifts might have been in the region, but, region, but we're, getting out of our competencies in terms of our skill sets in the studio. So we ended up working with someone at Humboldt State who's a remote sensing expert on the, on the SAR data. And he was, help, he was able to help us produce this drawing, which basically gets, gets to the, uh, the length of the boats um, and how confident we are in, in, that, in those lengths. And so you get some very large boats. Um, and so the question ultimately becomes, uh, we're in the, middle, you know, in the middle of a conflict in, in an area where there's not a lot of uh, maritime, there's not a lot of trade going on, and a lot of NATO ships. You know, who has a 300 meter long boat? Who has a 225 meter long boat, et cetera? Um, and you can't, you know, we can't say with certainty, we can say these are all boats, right, or vessels. We can't say with certain certainty who they belong to, but we can, we can, add, we can put the question to NATO, right? And that's what we did um, working with Human Rights Watch. Um, they didn't answer the question, uh, but this may ultimately be useful in the trial as a sort of um, part of the kind of circumstantial evidence that will be submitted to op reopen the case. Um, just to, sorry to explain what you're looking at here, this yellow area is a full day, um, and this SAR snapshot is a moment, uh, I think it's around 3 p.m. that day. Um, it should give you an indication of you know, what the, the density of vessels that were in the area. Um, and I'll come back to this point in a bit, a bit later, but the format for this was really driven by uh, the legal context that it was destined for um, and the human rights organization. So a lot of what we were doing was time-based, um, but ultimately had to be kind of codified in a PDF format that you could print out for a judge. Um, and so all of it was condensed as sort of stills and, and put into this PDF, which uh, ultimately was 80 or 90 pages. The images were about 10 or 15 of that. Um, and, but left us with some open questions, sort of um, procedurally, how can we do this again next time and have leveraged some of the more interactive or time-based components in, in the report format itself. So the next project I'll show you, and I'm, I'm happy to sort of answer any questions you all have it's either now or later about that project. Um, the next project I'll show you is kind of the next, actually I can just advance. Um, sort of representationally is the next step uh, in how we were approaching the case studies. Um, this was a project we worked on for Michael Sfard and Emily Schaefer um, as part of the Forensic Architecture Project. They're, they're lawyers. Uh, in, in Israel um, who were looking to uh, file, a, file a motion to ban the use of white phosphorus, air, airburst white phosphorus in 
densely populated urban areas. And the, the reason this is sort of on their radar was uh, that during Operation Cast Lead, um, this particular type of munition was uh, used very heavily in densely populated urban environments. And they make the claim that it's an indiscriminate weapon, it's an incendiary weapon, it should be banned by Protocol 3. Um, but uh, IDF continues to use it, the Americans continue to use it. Um, and so that was the kind of point of departure for this, for this project. So what you're seeing here is it's, this is all footage from Gaza. And what's interesting about this project is that there was a ton of available citizen captured video and, and photography. And what's also slightly perverse about this is that despite the amount of footage that exists, uh, we had to go to great lengths to make an argument for the fact that it's actually indiscriminate. Although I think most people would agree that it's pretty, pretty clear that anything that falls within the, the ellipse covered by this area is gonna get hit by these wedges. So basically what it is, it's a munition, it's a, it's a 155 millimeter munition which bursts, um, it's fired from artillery, it bursts anywhere between uh, 70 and 150 meters above the ground and it inside, yeah, inside it's got 116 felt soaked phosphorus wedges. Um, as soon as those wedges come into contact with the oxygen they begin to burn and uh, so what you see in images like this is basically it opens and they, they, they begin to burn immediately and they, they continue to burn when they land on the ground white, you know, white hot. The danger is, of course, if you get hit by one of these, it's, it's, it's sort of chemical and thermal burns are, are very dangerous, but the, the sort of the way it interacts with architecture and urban environment is a kind of bigger issue because basically it starts fires and traps people and they burn to death. Um, they also continue to burn for weeks after they're used. So this is an example, it's not uncommon in Gaza for weeks after Operation Cast Lead, you know, kids would like flip one over and it would start burning again. It just needs to be exposed to oxygen and it'll, it'll kind of continue to burn until it's, until it's done. Um, I believe this is just to show images from Iraq, Afghanistan. Um, and the way it was uh, originally developed um, was as a smoke screen. So and it was sort of very long, you know, it's been used since the Second World War um, to sort of create a screen between the army deploying it and, and the sort of opposing army to mask movements, troop movements. The, and it works well in that sense. The, the issue is uh, it has other consequences when it's used in the middle of an urban environment. So in this case, you can see it ricocheting everywhere, amplifying the coverage. Um, and when it's used in an urban environment, uh, it's, it's hard to argue that it's just serving as a smoke screen. It's also serving as an incendiary weapon. Um, the issue, and I won't get into this for too long, but the issue, uh, legally speaking, which is really was really important for us to get a handle on before we started our work, was that um, despite the fact that there's very clear uh, law about the necessity, you know, in terms of laws of war, international law, to distinguish between civilians and, and combatants, um, there's also very clear law uh, on the books. Um, what's proof of this? Uh, called the convention, uh, the convention on Certain Conventional Weapons, which basically bans certain types of weapons and focuses on things like cluster munitions and landmines, uh, and also incendiaries. Um, however, there's a kind of loophole here which states that in order to be qualified as an incendiary, it has to be designed as an incendiary. So the argument, the legal argument is basically if it's designed as a smokescreen, it has secondary incendiary effects, it's legal, right? Um, munitions which may have incendiary, uh, inc incidental incendiary effects such as illuminants, tracers, smoke, or signaling systems uh, are not included in this law. So on the one hand, you have the, the, the obligation to distinguish between um, civilians and combatants. On the other hand, you have a very clear law which is actually designed to prevent the use of incendiaries in, in urban environments, exempting this one particular weapon which is being used um, in urban environments. Um, interestingly, there was, a, there was a legal opinion that was uh, produced by a, an army lawyer um, which has a kind of, uh, which basically lays out a legal case for why 
it's, it's, it is legal to use these munitions and why in Operation Cast Lead it's legal under international law. But then the second half of the paper is actually why it's a bad idea in terms of counterinsurgency strategy because it alienates uh, the people you, know, you might be using it, whose, whose environments you might be using it on precisely because it causes fires, kills people, is indiscriminate, et cetera. So, um, so as a matter of policy and not as a matter of law, he suggests the U.S. should be using this weapon. Um, so just very briefly, what did, what did we end up doing? We were given the task of, since the law is flawed and, and sort of has loopholes in it, we were given the task of a kind of um, performance-based analysis, just to show as clearly as we possibly could how the weapon works and to try and quantify its effects in an urban context, which is, um, a bit of a sort of paradox with an indiscriminate weapon. But this is critical. We were liaising with people on the ground to help us understand what we were looking at in different photographs, um, which, which would help us do things like this, which is to try and get a rough estimate of height of burst, opening angle, things like that, so then we can then make models um, showing coverage areas over specific urban environments. Um, there was no shortage of, sort of publicly produced information on this project. And I'll just quickly show you the uh, report. Um, so this is kind of our sort of, in terms of how we chose to represent the material, a second attempt at um, how, we could, how we could do a report, basically. Um, we were able to include video footage um, that we worked on, sort of pulled information out of, so you can see here, um, creating a series of diagrams on top of the footage and trying to quantify a range of, of opening angles and heights of bursts, and we could then run the model ourselves. Um, there's some information about this munition that's publicly available, but not a ton. And uh, this is all super obvious, obviously, um, but, needs, but needed to be done. It needed to be sort of quantified and mapped and drawn out for Michael and Emily. And to say basically how much area is covered. Um, some of the other stuff we did was to take drawing, to take image, uh, videos like this, which were a sequence of photos, and then to, to basically construct the space and to take the viewer through uh, the space that, in which the photographs were taken. And why this is important is because it helps us understand uh, how this weapon is particularly dangerous when it, when it penetrates windows, when it gets captured on balconies, um, when it ricochets off of other buildings. This was a case, a UN school that was hit, um, and uh, I think three students died and they were trapped in the classroom. And usually you see this as a bunch of photos, but um, the idea here is that it helps you understand how it actually interacts with the space to create these scenarios. The other thing we did um, was uh, this set of maps, which basically, once we were fairly comfortable with a range of coverage areas that we thought were um, likely with this munition, uh, Michael actually asked us to not only show how it would work in Gaza, but how it might work in Tel Aviv, which was certainly a rhetorical sort of conceit on his part, um, and New York City and Paris and anywhere else for that matter. So uh, where possible, we got demographic information. And you know we can't say much, but we can say something about you know, what would happen if it fell in a residential district, um, a commercial district. And in one of the most densely populated areas in the world, how many housing units might be hit if you were to put it in the middle of a residential neighborhood in Gaza, which happened frequently. Um, you know, ultimately, our conclusion is that basically, you can, you, know, you can determine with some degree of accuracy the range of sizes of coverage for these ellipses, but you cannot say anything about where the wedges are gonna fall within that space.
And we had to, you know, as part of this, we, we there's this sort of technical annex that we had to include, um, both in terms of the specifications of the wedges, the munition, and also the sort of procedurally, in terms of uh, our work as well. Um, and the last project I'll show really briefly, just as a sort of third in the sequence of this evolution of report format is one that's not done, and in fact, Charles has been working on a lot. Um, this is a, a project that we're working on with Paulo Tavares um, and A.L. Weissman. Looking, it started as a, looking at the administration of Rio Smont in the early 80s in Guatemala, um, and specifically at the kind of scorched earth campaigns that were carried out and the displacement of of villagers into what were called model villages. Um, I'm not going to go into all of it, but I just want to show you the way that we're sort of thinking about this project is as, a, as an online a platform, which um, allows us to do things like take uh, you know, shape files, um, here showing troop movements that were that are uh, elaborated from a, a, a military log that was got that was that was acquired through a Freedom of Information Act um, recently. Um, to where possible, you know, move through that information in time. Um, and this is all I should say, and very much in process, as you can probably tell. Um, And then look at things like, um, did I get this? you know, in this case, we're looking at uh, aerial photographs that were taken during the period, um, which provide very good resolution uh, imagery of the model villages. So this is a photograph taken in 1991. Um, you know, we have Landsat imagery from that period of time, but nothing that's going to provide us resolution of the sort of first first uh, implementation of these model villages. And so what this is clear evidence of, um, in this case, is the sort of repatriation of, um, of local populations to these, these model villages where they're, um, they're, they were monitored and their lives were highly, highly regulated um, as part of the military campaign. Here you just see those images a bit larger. So basically, this is driving uh, MB tiles, raster imagery, to a, like a Bing, you know, Bing server. But allows us to go through each village and, and look at it in greater detail. And one has the opportunity to kind of zoom in and zoom out at their leisure. Um, it's maybe a slower way of being able to move through the platform, or the material, I should say. Um, I'm sorry. This is a, basically a study that we reconstructed from uh, a someone who was working the Genocide Studies program at Yale, who had done this really interesting uh, comparison between 79 and 86 Landsat imagery. So basically this is a difference map showing vegetation index, and what you see in red is the kind of um, greatest amount of, uh, of transformation of the, uh, of the vegetation of the environment. Um, and aligns with the sort of uh, history of um, scorched earth policies. Basically, they would go in, they would not only burn villages, but they would also destroy a lot of areas before making these model villages. So it's, it's part of the kind of complete picture, repatriation picture. Um, move through these fast. And then this is just an example of a, so this is, I think we have images both from 64 and 91, this is 64, so it just shows you kind of before and after. So here you can see the model village popping up on the left. Sometimes they were very close to the place, uh, places from which people were displaced, so you know, this was where the village originally was. Um, this is the sort of model village that the military built. And, um, these were all destroyed. Sometimes the model villages are actually you know, tens of miles, hundreds of miles away from, from the villages themselves. But, just, just sort of an indication of where we're trying to go with the, this type of report, and um, we're working on a report right now, which will be published on Friday for the, for the UN. 
on drone strikes, which is a sort of more finished version of this that I, I can't show tonight, unfortunately. Did, did you get the geo, the spec, the geo the aerial photographs? It should be a Bing, the Bing that images. The yeah, the Bing images underneath. This is actually an aerial photograph That's here. Like digital yeah, but I think what you're seeing is, um, see how it refreshes? Yeah. I think it's actually referring to the image underneath and not the, not the photograph above. This is definitely not a satellite image. This is an aerial okay. photo. So. Okay. Yeah. You can see the big map there. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's very compressed. Anyways, that's the last thing I'll show you. Yeah, thanks. Actually, I have, I have um, tons of questions. You want me to leave it up? Huh? Shall I leave it up? Uh, yeah. Yeah. You want to leave it up a Yeah. Um, so I, I'm just curious in, in terms of your practice, where, where this, this work actually fits in. Um, you know, clearly you do a lot of work that also is, you know, that's full of art. Yeah. Um, museums and things like that. So this, this work, um, can, can everyone hear me? Yeah. So this work is very, um, you know, in terms of calling itself um, forensic architecture and working with human rights organizations and things like that. It's, it's really trying to find the truth in, right, and really trying to use these technologies to solve, to solve problems. Um, and so I wonder how seriously, how seriously you take that, right? Because I, you know, the book, the, the book I've just um, finished w is more is um, following the tra trajectory of my of my own work, which I've started calling para empirical, right? Because it's mm -hmm. um, uh, because I don't really believe there's such a thing as a as a requisite that that any um, data. The, you know, can be considered a true representation of what it's trying to represent. Mm -hmm. So there's, so what other, what some people say is true and factual and objective and like, right, all those words that you need to use in a court of law, mm -hmm. um, don't, don't hold up when it comes to these artistic images you're producing, right, because you're artfully, and I don't mean that in terms of like an aesthetic, I'm, you know, you're trying to make it look pretty. Right. It's just that it's embedded in what you're doing that all the images are doing are providing an interpretation of yeah. this. Yeah. So I'm just curious where you see that vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, um, an, um, an architecture of images or a spatial, you know, like a s um, uh, spatial research that you can do through images versus having an activist mm -hmm. practice which is really trying to mm -hmm. insert itself in this legal yeah, I mean, I think what was surprising and what continues to be surprising and shocking is that the rhetorical role of this work is as mm. primary as any pursuit of truth, let's say, or um, questions of admissibility in a legal context. So, I mean, sometimes these things are destined for advocacy mm. contexts, sometimes they're destined for courts, but uh, Time and again, what's surprising and kind of interesting is that the lawyers we work with are leveraging this material um, aesthetically, rhetorically, um, in terms of advocacy in ways which are squarely outside the sort of pure pursuit of the facts, let's right. say. Which is, and you're comfortable with that? Well, yeah, I mean, yes. I mean, I think we've grown, yeah. we've grown to be. It doesn't make the work any less rigorous because it has yeah. to 
stand up and work in whatever context it's destined yeah. for, but I can give you a concrete example. Mm -hmm. um, we're doing a project now for the UN Special Rapporteur on Counterterrorism, who's launched an inquiry into civilian casualties from drone strikes. Mm -hmm. And um, his, his mandate is, is to conduct an inquiry, just that. And the distinction between an inquiry and a, a case is really important here because um, he's, you know, this is partially about uh, calling for a trial and not a trial itself. Yeah. And so uh, it's, it's really about advocacy. It's about sort of uh, the way that getting a public momentum behind the call for an actual in UN inquiry. And to that extent, um, any type of media that we might want to use, we can use. Whereas in a court, it's, it's much more restricted. Yeah. So then how do you see um, the difference between what you're doing and say Colin Powell when he goes before the UN and says, you know, here is a yeah. weapon of mass destruction and, you know, points yeah. to this and this and that. How do you see the difference in the mm. rhetoric? Uh, you mean in terms of uh, statesmen making a claim about yeah. facts on the ground, so to speak? Right, right. Um, it's not a distinction that I would that I would draw. I mean, our our only role, I think, and our our only obligation not our only obligation, but our role is to provide the people that are experts with the information they need to answer the questions they're asking us. We don't we don't sort of identify yeah. the questions okay. themselves. Yeah. Um, See, then I, I guess I'm being a little bit of devil devil's advocate, yeah, yeah. right? But, but I think that um, but but I think that what is important in um, the presentation of the work is both the rhetoric yeah. <laughs> and <coughs> or the ways when, in which it can be used as, as facts, mm -hmm. but then the ways in which it might not be able to be used as, mm -hmm. as a fact. And, and, and to sort of draw out that distinction between your own reason yeah. for doing the work as an intellectual pursuit. Because yeah. right? I, I would hate you to become a like detective. Yeah. I don't know. I just I just see um well, I think the, like the work is, is yeah. so it has to be so precise all the time. Yeah. To to get well, yeah, I guess I guess it's whether that's whether you see yourself doing more more and more of mm -hmm. that or whether you see something uh more nuanced and um rhetorical. <coughs> yeah. Well, I think that um, for us, it's actually really important that the work has efficacy. In other words, if, if, it's, if we're being commissioned by Human Rights Watch or Michael and Emily or other people, we want it's, it's critical that whatever we produce works for them. If, uh -huh. it, if it grows into another project, um, I feel like those limits are super important to us when it, when it yeah. sort of. So you want to end up being an agency where people come to you yeah. and ask for this kind of imagery because I mean because I know that th it's a combination right now of yeah. you trying to find convincing people yeah. that this is a methodology yeah. you know, that this is a good methodology I, because I know because I've like, you know, right. followed this, this project yeah. um, so I wonder at which moment you uh, it, it, if it's even possible for you to really become that expert that people well, that will call and you, you yeah. say it's starting to happen it is starting to happen, but what's also yeah. happening is like this work gets so far, and then our our credibility uh, gets attacked. Yeah. You know? uh, it gets uh, uh. thrown into question. You know, we're designers, we're architects. Why are we even? We'll see. The yeah. IDF will say it shouldn't be admissible. Uh, they don't right. have the qualifications, or the expertise. On the other hand, no one else is sort of has. The, I would argue that, that this toolkit is uniquely an architectural one, at least right. at least for now. Okay. Um, so there's certain things we're doing that others may or may not be able to do. But what's what's clear is that in terms of advocacy, it seems to be um, we've had it's been effective in certain cases. Right. In legal contexts, we've been running up against this question of uh, right. our qualifications. How do you think you do? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's a really interesting question, right? Because yeah. architectural expertise it, it, it presupposes design and it presupposes, yeah. um, you know aesthetics and interpretation and like all of those, all of those really fuzzy words. And so maybe, um, and uh, 
you know, imagery experts themselves as well will be the first to say that there's no such thing as, um, uh, you know, as the science of image interpretation. There's always an art and a science of image interpretation, and mm -hmm. that's, that's, but that's also kind of working as part of my a part of the work yeah. that I've done. And when you when you interview these people, that's what they talk about. So maybe there's a way of, you know, of bringing that in, like where. Um, where does the art help you be more precise? Yeah. And I think there's a way of talking about this work in that way, right. just as much as constantly saying, you know, you know, I had to draw the boat and you know, I had to have exactly the right size. Right. And right. There's just, you know, it's so, there, there's sort of so much potential in the way that you can, yeah. that you could talk about it, which I think would, um, would really, yeah, make it even more, I mean, I wonder even if more powerful, just because in terms of what the audience is, right? Because you might be using this for a court of law, right. but when you're using it for advocacy purposes and for communication, there's another whole level that you can do it at. Yeah, yeah I mean, I wonder so, yeah. what you think about the, whether or not the architect or designer sort of uniquely qualified or can, it's a sort of a skill set which allows them to work very synthetically. In other words, it's in, other, in other scenarios, people tend to get siloed in terms of their expertise, yeah. whether they're a remote sensing expert or they're a oceanographer, et cetera. Um, I wonder whether you think that the sort of training as designers and the way we think about how we approach buildings, for example, urban, yeah. urban plans, allows us to bring a different yeah, process. Just simple. And, uh, and I also yeah. think because we learn more and more about data as architects and planners now than we used to, yeah. that it also brings us into that object, you know, that so-called world of objectification and scientific things which we weren't in before. Right. Um, and I think that that's a big, that's a big change. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's super, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really interesting, but I, I, I'm also really happy about those reports because I think the report is the most undervalued um, form of writing. Yeah. Um, and they're, you know, I think in the 70s and 60s, and there were lots more reports written by architects. Right, um, just in terms of textual. Uh, and yeah, in terms yeah. of you know they did it for planning departments and for um, you know I don't know what they uh, like Kistics, um what's his name? Um, oh God, you know the guy who did all those drawings of Africa and did global maps for Doxy Adams. Uh -huh. um, yeah, and just all those, all of those reports that were very, that had a lot of data in them, yeah. and things that architects did for the UN in the, yeah. in the 60s and 70s. We should pull up some of those, yeah. those things, because that, um, and I just also love the way you're using the PDFs and the um, embedding. That, that's another whole part of the project that you're kind of undervaluing yeah. in, some, in some way that could be um, ratcheted up a little bit. Sure. If you, Presented in different contexts. You yeah, know, that's another. And that was a kind of role with the, the um, geospatial information is that the websites are often very interactive. Uh -huh. Geospatial websites at the moment are very interactive, and there's a lot of possibilities. But there's not a. There aren't a lot of uh, platforms that combine geospatial information with report structures. In other words, yeah. like a table of contents, an index, and a kind of yeah, narrative exactly. yeah. sequence. So that. The ambition with that was to kind of tie a report structure to, you know, whether it's shape files or geotips or um, right, any exactly. other form of geospatial information. Yeah, that's getting easier, I think, with Mapbox. Yeah. Open, all of the open source tools. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That was yeah. Yeah. So should we open it? Open it up. Anybody have any questions or? Yeah. yeah, I think um, coming, sort of coming out of sort of looking at mapping and really, really early geospatial information in the 60s, the tail end of the 60s, almost to the 70s, almost the flow land of that starts. Um, you know, there's a history of the expertise that I think um, John Cloud has researched where mm -hmm. like so much of the earth sciences and the remote sensing information was developed in sort of civilian government arms um, while the actual data is coming out of 
perception of error and kind of the ability of um, like the most open access to PBS and the statistic the whole thing of convergence. Um, I guess my question is comes back around and is very broad. Uh, are there different types of sort of institutional convergence, not just your work with engineers and you know architects and advocacy yeah. agencies for you and the UC, but another Um, well, I don't know about partnerships, but your question definitely makes me think of the, the SAR data scenario because the availability of SAR data and the kind of funding that it received to even put these satellites in orbit um, was all driven by security concerns. And, and the fact that there are opportunities to kind of flip the, leverage that scenario to actually look at military assets as opposed to sort of ships that might be coming to the borders of these countries is, is only made possible because of the kind of um, its its role as a security apparatus. So I think there's an interesting, whenever there are moments to do that, to kind of um, take technologies which have been developed and, and, and funded and invested for, for military reasons and use them in different contexts. That was a kind of big, very interesting moment in the SAR data because all the papers we were looking at were were, were uh, border control, basically. What's the resolution of the? Uh, can you the see ones. A ship? Can you, what's that? How, how well can you see the ship? They have different resolutions. Um, Fifty meter, I think, is what we were. But you, the, it's a radar return, so right. you That's can actually right. see something half the size of the res, of the resolution of the oh, okay. of the pixel, right? Yeah. And you can go all the way down to very. 10 meter resolution, but that's very scarce. Usually it's like 50 to 100 right. meter resolution. Yeah. But 50 no, it's amazing you. how difficult it is to still to, to track ships. Yeah. And because I've been doing a project about um, crude oil sh shipping. Yep, so AIS data? Yeah, yeah, right. And they just switch the GPS on and off, so then you see these huge gaps in the, in the yeah. data. Yeah. But I might have the, the data this you doing March to April 2011? Yeah. I might have like a whole oh, really? data set of just all the ships moving in the world. That would be amazing. <laughs> and I don't know yeah. how, I don't know what the limit, <laughs> I don't know what the limit of your ships are, you know, like whether it tracks, I don't know what the smallest ship is. That it I think it would, it would see it, in theory, it would see a 25 meter long, as long as it's ship. metal. No, it's just, it's the, it's the fact that the ship has to report its movement. Yeah, well so NATO ships aren't doing that, but the, Commercial vessels will be right. Right. And, and that's the thing. So vessels. anything that captured, yeah, any, it would be a leisure vessel and a container vessel yes. and a right. crude oil, crude, you know, energy vessel. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know yeah. what's included and in there, but that's a logistics question. Those are logistics. Yeah. But it's exactly the year I have had like I don't know millions of ships, yeah. <laughs> like ten thousand ships or something. Okay, so that would be good. We can yeah. rule out yeah. some of those returns. Yeah. It is not, yeah, but you just see a lot of the gaps more than, yeah. Okay. Yeah. The example I can give you is that, um, I didn't show it today, but there's another case involving a protester that was killed. Um, again, uh, this was a military tribunal in Israel. Um, and when we first submitted the report as part of an appeal, they reopened the case. And so it seemed like the work was effective. And then they took about two years to decide whether or not they were actually gonna have a trial. And ultimately they decided they weren't gonna have a trial. And one of the reasons they gave was our, our um, lack of you know, expertise. So it didn't have to do with the, okay. yeah. we weren't damaged by the sort of how beautiful or, or the presentation of the work, but it was, it's always about whether or not we're credible as expert witnesses. And I think whether or not we get more credible over time remains to be seen. But like in the case of the UN, it's like it's a non-issue. Mm -hmm. The inquiry is gonna be presented, it's gonna sort of play out as it does publicly and may or may not be effective in convincing people that a case should actually occur. Yeah. Yeah. I, I will say though that 
anything that gets people to look hard is been useful. Is, yeah, yeah, right. Whether or not it actually gets used, you, you don't know what the effect. Yeah. Yeah. Is, yeah. yeah. Huh. How do you use an art technician to start working with an organization like the UN? Do they just like put out calls or? Um, no, actually. Yeah, no, I'm in the beginning of this project, so AOL got this grant, um, and we went around to different human rights organizations saying, you know, this is the type of work we can do. Do you have any cases that are spatial in nature that might benefit, that this, this approach could be applied to? And um, that's how we start to line up case studies. And uh, one of AOL's colleagues, Susan Shupley, um, I believe just kind of cold called Ben Emerson who's a UN Special Rapporteur, um, <laughs> and said, can we help you with this, you know? And in the human rights world, you can imagine, you know, they're always raising money, trying to raise money, and funds are scarce, and so when you're banging at their door saying, we have a grant to help you do this, you know, and they're impressed by the work, it, the opportunities kind of open up. Whether or not the work continues after the grant ends is another story, you know. Their human Rights Watch just hired its first statistician in the entire history of the organization. So there, you're also battling against the kind of culture of um, testimony-driven, um, on, the, on the ground sort of research. So the integration of sort of quantitative and spatial visualization, that type of, it's, it's, it's happening in different places, but slowly, I would say. Probably not easy for an organization like that either. To, yeah, no, and, and to commit funds, I think, is even, it's not their first priority. I think I understand your question. Uh, but I mean, if it's happening from within an organization, it's a human rights organization that's supposed to be working on this stuff. Like, what are architects doing working on this? I mean, we're, we're not your typical profile for expert witness in, in human rights work. So it's, it's pretty, I mean, it was, it was expected and it's clear to me why they'd be questioning our credentials. Um, and the, the data that we use in the sort of, if it's satellite imagery or SAR data, it's, same type of information that other organizations might use. I think what might be a bit different is, you know, how we might use, um, how we might do some coding on the back end of a platform or how we might use Grasshopper to sort of visualize the trajectory of a certain munition when fired at different angles iteratively. Um, so some of the tools which allow you to do slightly more sophisticated types of work quickly is I think what's a bit different in terms of what we do and what Human Rights Watch or Amnesty yeah. can do at the moment. Yeah. Well, it's also interesting that there probably was a model or some model of how the ballistics blow up, but it's in like gun paper or yeah. things like that. It's called the well, sort of redoing or it's like a recycling technique for like Yeah, it isn't, it isn't. I mean it's super, it's incredibly obvious what's happening. Yeah. Right? And yet you still have to draw it, and you still have to quantify it, and you still have to present it. Um, that's the part that kind of continues to be strange, mm -hmm. right? The obligation to represent something which is totally clear. Like, for example, we had, we had to work on a case where a, a protester was bound with his hands behind his back, blindfolded, and was shot at you know, about this distance in the foot with a rubber bullet. And the, because the image's cr video is cropped just, just above his feet, the entire case is Sort of th and then basically the lieutenant and the 
officer that shot him said there was a miscommunication, there was a door, there was a car door in the way, et cetera, when it's completely obvious what's happening. And so we're then tasked with trying to reconstruct the event regardless, which is very much a legal mandate, you know, an absurd one, but a necessary one. You know? And I don't know if that's productive for design studios to be doing or not. I mean, it's just sort of ridiculous exercise. But, well, but that's what I'm asking, yeah, yeah. That, if it, because I think for a design studio to do it, there needs to be um, sort of five reasons for, yeah. making, for making the images, and there definitely are, right? Yeah. It's just how you how you use them in each of these different contexts, or so whether you're interested in that, or whether you know you're mostly interested in using it in the activist way. Well, do you think it would undermine our potentially undermine our efficacy if we began to explore those other four? scenarios and that's my that's my fear is that yeah but i think well like the work that i've done in criminal justice it doesn't matter yeah you know you can use it in different forms because the one doesn't undermine doesn't undermine the other in fact it gives it more publicity and it, you know if it's being used you know if it gets into the newspaper for instance yeah you know, there's all kinds of ways that it can be used before it gets into a court of law, yeah. or aside from being in a court of law, once, I, I don't know if that's allowed or not, right? Because then it becomes this whole declassification thing. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder where you're more effective mm -hmm. in the advocacy role. Mm -hmm. um, Do you find the conversations that arise in, the con in art contexts are different or more or somehow more productive than the ones that might happen it, in policy context? Uh, uh, well, I think art and policy can go together. Yeah. Um, but law is different. Yeah. You know, when you deal with classification versus declassification, yeah. that whole thing is, is different. And art and policy, definitely, they definitely go together. They belong together. They just don't know it. Right. <laughs> I think. <laughs> you can get them together in the same room? Yeah. And, uh -huh. Yeah. They, I mean, I don't mean art and in the, in the sort of aesthetic mm -hmm. sense of the word, I just mean art in terms of its audiences and yeah. how it communicates and all of that. Yeah, I mean, I find that when this work is actually shown in art context, it immediately goes to questions of sort of truth construction and yeah. um, which are super interesting, but very different conversations than are had in when we walk into Human Rights Watch or other NGOs. They don't care, actually. Yeah, well then I wonder if it's effective, right? So yeah. I think I think for, for it to be effective and you should be getting people in other contexts to be worried about the people in the ships and the yeah. phosphorus and it shouldn't be just a discussion about the aesthetics of the images. That I completely agree with. Yeah. Yeah, I think the discussion has to be one and the same. Mm -hmm. uh, I, it's just a very familiar conundrum yeah. to me and I think um, I, I just, it's a pity if all it can be judged by is whether it gets admitted into evidence or not. Mm -hmm. There's just so much else. Yeah, because right? you could do a ton of work also, and then yeah. we've, we've done this, and it's just gone nowhere in certain right, cases. Right, right, the there end. are all kinds of other ways in yeah. which you can use it. So, yeah, yeah especially, especially in media. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I think it'll be really interesting to see who actually comes to request this kind of work, whether yeah. it will be the human rights people or you know, it could be the military too. Yeah. Then what? Right. <laughs> yeah. So they're probably more adventurous in in who they call yeah, well, actually the, the, in who they call an expert witness. The um, the folks who are in the weapons division of Human Rights Watch are all <laughs> former military. And so that line between yeah. military and humanitarian work is sometimes Blurry. Not as distinct as right. only this one. Yeah. Well, cool. thank you. Cool. Okay. Um, I think we should keep asking questions. I'm going to open up another bottle of wine and we can like. Okay. Cool. Thank right. you for coming. Thanks.